Good morning. Going to revisit classical Greece today. Last time I was here, we took a short look at the classical period in Greece, and I may be overlapping, but I'm going to start at the beginning. As a teacher, as a lecturer, I often find that when I come upon certain periods of art that are seen as defining our ideas, I have my own difficulty as an artist and as a teacher in finding a way to convey this ideal without opinion. That is to say, the Greeks had very set ideas about what beauty ought to be. And interestingly enough, their ideals have filtered down through the art world even in today and had an absolute and irrevocable effect on the trajectory of Western art. That being said, some of their ideas don't always make sense in any particular time period, but an understanding of who they were and what their work is, is in my mind, imperative for understanding the human condition. Anyway, we're in the classical period of the Greeks right now, and this period is framed by the defeat of the Persians by the Greeks in 479 BCE, and then the death of Alexander in 323. So we actually have three periods in classical Greek art, and they've been given different names by different scholars. We have the transitional or early classical period, which is the 30 year period between 480 and 450 BCE. So they're transitioning from archaic to what we call classical. Their ideas are changing. They're getting better at sculpting, if you define better as following their ideals, being able to actualize their concepts in material form. Fifth century classical is considered by most scholars to be the height. Some call it high classical. I prefer the century designations. And, but interestingly enough, I mean, transitional or early goes into 450 BCE. 450 to 400 BCE is what we would call fifth century classical. And then fourth century classical goes from 400 to 323, so it's later. The concepts that the Greeks bring forward into their art are ideals of humanism, of rationalism, and idealism. So idealism and rationalism are sort of two ends of the same yardstick, if you will. Man is the measure of all things, which is hence the metaphor of the yardstick. Know thyself and nothing in excess. So as we've seen throughout the geometric and the archaic period, the Greeks are all about reason. They're developing philosophy, they're developing geometry, and they celebrate reason over, over emotion. They, they find all aspects of life to have meaning, to have pattern. They believe that nothing happens by accident. And so because of this, they ground their art in a very close observation of nature. So something that is closely observed, or if you will, lifelike, all the way to the action, as we'll see in a sculpture by Myron of a discus thrower, becomes a benchmark of quality for them. Now, we have transition periods, and these, these division of these periods is corresponding to historical events, which we have. And there's a historian named Herodotus that wrote so many books. You can study Greek history. But it also provides a frame through which we can discuss these artistic styles. So the early classical period is marking a new direction in the representation of human consciousness in sculpture. It's interesting to look at the vase paintings in the archaic and early classical period and contrast them to the sculpture because in the vase paintings, we see pathos and emotion. For example, look back at the slide of the suicide of Ajax, you know, for example, and the story that, that goes with that. And 
At the same time, we have these sculptures that are all about ethos, that are about perfection, that are about close detail. The vase paintings are much more abstract. So even during this time of discovering geometry, of figuring out the world, of representing the human figure and human events with this naturalistic accuracy, we have abstraction as well. So this transition comes at the beginning of the early classical period that some of the pathos that's reflected in the vase paintings will begin to find its way into sculpture. And we can see this transition on the pediments of the Temple of Aphaya in Aegina, which the island of Aegina has fought off and on with Athens for over two centuries. So when Athens finally conquered Aegina, they joined with Athens as an ally and they built this temple way out on the tip of the island where the Athenians could see it from the Acropolis. I've given you two links to the Temple of Aphaia because it's really interesting to look at the story of it. And I'm going to show you some images from that temple in a minute. In the fifth century classical period, from 450 to 400, we end up having a conflict between Sparta and Athens. We have the Peloponnesian Wars, which end with the defeat of Athens, and Pericles dominates Athenian politics. So Athens, actually, the, the city of Athens originated as a city on a hill. That's what the word Acropolis means, is city on a hill, which during the height of Athenian politics, politics. It was the religious sanctuary. It was a fortress and the social life revolved around it. Later on, different things happen. Here is a diagram or a reconstruction drawing of the Acropolis at its height with the Parthenon, which is the centerpiece to the Acropolis. And so, of course, we have the theater for athletic games and we have the sacred way for the processions. Again, we have this Greek division between buildings for specific uses. In making the, the Acropolis, they imported 22,000 tons of marble. And we had a sculptor named Phidias who was responsible for much of the work. So. Again, it's an organized plan. It's not just one thing built and then another next to it, another next to it. It's all conceived from start to finish. These 160 years establish the idea of beauty that's endured to now. So what I just gave you was somewhat of an overview between the early classical 5th century to 4th century classical period. Again, as I've said, it was framed by their success against the Persians until the defeat of Alexander. So in the early classical period, they succeed against the Persians and it gives them self-confidence. So we see the greatest accuracy of portrayal of the human figure between 480 to 450 BCE. This is a comparison for you. So these are sculptures, again, from the Temple of Aphaia. And we see on the east pediment, it's a dying warrior with an archaic style. And on the bottom, you see an early classical with the same subject. So these two pediments were made about 10 years apart. And remember, the temple would be built and then we would have these sculptors creating sculpture that would then be put up inside the pediments and attached there with like little iron rods. So all the time they're building this pediment, they have other people that are making sculpture. So we have this transition during the time of the temple actually being built from this archaic style to this new idea of portraying the warrior accurately to show that he's twisting, to show that he's turning. And later on, we're going to look at a sculptor named Polycleitos. It's really hard to make all of these events move in one timeline because you have many, many different people working in many different places kind of all together and they're all influenced by different things. If you look at these two together, you can see some real differences. Notice on the top, we have the archaic smile of the archaic warrior. He's very stiff. Remember what we said about the, about the two young boys that brought their mother to this festival, that they 
died at the height of human achievement. And that is what this warrior has done, is that he has achieved perfection in death and battle, and he is transcendent. He's beyond any emotion. In contrast, this warrior on the bottom, it's a dramatic stage, one distinct stage of a series of events. Here's a close-up of his face. So you can see that he's struggling to rise. And remember too, he would have been painted, he would have been filled up with bronze accessories. All these sculptures would have been painted, would have been very bright. We would have seen the glitter of the bronze. So it would have been a reconstruction of this battle. Here is some more sculpture from the Temple of Aphaya. And the body is converted conveying the softness of the flesh. You can clearly see the articulation of the shoulder in the archers and the expression on their faces. Notice on the right hand figure, the bulging of the calf muscle. There's a deep understanding of anatomy here. We see positive and negative space even in the gestures of the figures. The next temple that I want to look at is the Temple of Zeus. This is a Doric temple. It's in the sanctuary of Hera and Zeus, and it was completed between 470 and 456 BCE. It's all decorated with imported marble, and it depicts Apollo helping the Lapiths in a battle with the centaurs. This is the west pediment of this temple. And so you can see this contrast of angular forms with turning, twisting action. So Apollo here is celebrating the triumph of reason over barbarism. And this is a metope relief from the frieze of the same temple. Again, it's showing the action of the figures. We begin to see the softness in the figure, the modeling, the understanding of anatomy, even to the figure of Athena on the left helping hold up the sky, you can see the articulation of her arm muscles, the calm expression of their faces, but yet these three figures are interacting with each other. So again, it's a section of a story. In freestanding sculpture, they move away from this rigid frontal figure. So this is sort of the next stage and, and it's, I would say, I don't know whether to call this a Koros figure. You know, it is definitely an early classical sculpture. He is stepping forward. There's no trace of the archaic smile on this figure at all. Now, you're going to see these Riasi warriors again, and they're found on the seafloor off the coast of Riasi in Italy, and I've put them here because they date to 460 BCE. We can see idealized anatomical forms and naturalistic details, but these are bronzes, and again, this is, the art historical story that we find these figures, but these were at the bottom of the ocean on a ship. So we really don't know where they were made. They're given their names because that's where they were found. You can see it from behind. It's got this slight contrapposto pose that we're gonna see a little bit later with the sculptor Polycletos. But notice the expression. There is, the, you know, the expression, the way the beard and the hair are treated, much more naturalistic detail, although this is bronze too. So remember that the medium also is going to dictate the amount of detail that can be brought about because the way that bronze casting is done, of course, is by sculpting with soft modeling. So you can get a lot of different kinds of detail than you can with stone sculpture at this time. So on the Temple of Aphaea in Aegina, the, it, it's a narrative of the battle of the Greeks and Trojans who are led by Hercules. And the central figure, of course, is the goddess Athena. It's located up on the rocky ridge of the island's northeast corner so the Athenians could see the temple. And the temple was symbolic of this new relationship between Aegina and Athens. So the Parthenon is a masterpiece of architectural engineering. And you can see it's it's pretty destroyed, obviously, but you can see up here where the metopes are with the sculpture and much of the sculpture, of course, is gone. These reconstruction drawings show you the location of the Parthenon. If you imagine the tops of these buildings all taken off. So if you recall, all these little round dots are columns and the solid lines are solid walls. So the openings are where doors are. You can see where the large statue of Athena is in the center of the Parthenon, the Erechtheion over on the other side of the hill 
well. And if you look over to the left, the drawing of the of this drawing on the very top, crown in the Acropolis, is the Parthenon with the amph two amphitheaters, the larger one down on the right, and the Rectheon is over on the left. Here's a reconstruction drawing. And so you have to imagine this entire structure was created as one creation. There's 22, it has 22,000 tons of marbles in it and one architect. He's a sculptor and an artist and an architect and he was responsible for most of the work on this. So it's an incredible achievement for one person. Of course he had help, but this diagram gives you a sense of the scale, the size of the Parthenon compared to the other buildings. And you can imagine, again, as in Delphi or as in any of these other complexes, each single specific building has its own specific use. And the processions would climb up between each building at different times of the year or different ceremonies to Athena. So it's a reflection of the triumph of Athens over Persia. It's an honor to Athena, the triumph of civilization over barbarism, because the Greeks saw themselves as victors, not only because they were strong, because they were smart. So Athena is the goddess of war and the goddess of wisdom. The sculpture of the Parthenon is done during what's called the mature classical period or later fourth century. Greek artists perfected the representation of the human body during this time. So Phidias is responsible for the gold and ivory image of Athena Parthenos in the center of the Parthenon. The sculptures on the pediments, the metopes and the frieze of the Parthenon. So here's an image of a pediment from the Parthenon. And of course, these pediments all had sculpture in the round at one time, but most of it's been lost and it's being reconstructed. So sculptors use the locations of pinholes in the shells of the cornice to kind of reconstruct how it would have been arra arranged. So on the west pediment, there's a contest between Athena and Poseidon over Athens. And then the east pediment illustrated the birth of Athena from her father, Zeus. Here is Dionysos from the pediment of the Parthenon. And this figure is a very good example of the skill of the sculptor Phaedias. So here is Dionysus in the nude, and you can really see that Phidias is very interested in the way the body behaves in different positions. So Dionysus is reclining here, and his abdomen is actually concave. The flesh is falling in against the rib cage into the pelvis, and you can see his left arm, the muscles are holding him up, and in the right arm, of course, he, he's holding something up. It's missing, but it's naturalistic a divine sense of perfection. So he's depicting a God in as perfect human beauty. I made this bigger for you so that you can see the detail. Notice the detail in the drapery, the detail in the facial expression, the detail in the twisting and the turning of the legs. The sculptures from the east pediment are known as the Elgin marbles, and they represent the goddess Hestia and her mother Dione. This whole East West pediment illustrates the birth of Athena from her father, Zeus. But notice the way that the Greeks are treating the drapery here. They are masters of anatomy. You can see the transparency of the drapery and the beauty of the female body underneath. So it's really a naturalism that we have not yet seen in the history of art at all. We've seen drapery, but it's been stiff or just hanging. This drapery is now wrapping around the body and it's bold, it's whirling, it's heavy folds. So you can see there's many centuries spent analyzing the human body to create this masterful sculpture. So this is again the east facade of the Parthenon. So the pediment is up above. Here we see the metopes and the frieze, which we would see from below. So this sort of helps us recreate the position of the viewer. Remember, this thing is huge. So if you're standing underneath, in order to be able to see with the sculpture in the metope, it needs to be sticking out. You can see the frieze behind the two columns. So here are two reliefs from the metopes. 
they're illustrating the Lapiths fighting the centaurs. So this perfect moment of pause. Again, the next logical phase in a narrative transition where a narrative is a series of single events. So according to the Greek legend, the Lapiths had a wedding and they invited the centaurs to come. Now, centaurs are unpredictable creatures at best. They're wise and they uh, have their own set of morals and their own moral code, but they're unpredictable. They drank too much and they stole the Lapith women from the wedding. So this is a symbol of pathos. It's a symbol of emotion over reason. So the Greeks and the centaurs fight, of course, over this. So it's a symbol of the victory of the Greeks over the Persians, ethos over pathos, reason over emotion. And here's a detail. So if you think about yourself standing down underneath the Parthenon in that previous slide and looking up, you can see how this figure, it's actually cut in front of the centaur and even the centaur is coming out from the wall. The drapery again is draped over the upper arm of the figure. So when you look up, you'll see these figures coming out at you and you'll be able to see all of the action. Now the frieze, in contrast, and remember the frieze was that part behind the columns under the metopes, is carved in a very low relief. And it goes all the way around the Parthenon and it depicts what's called the Panathenaic procession, which is held every four years to honor Athena. So it begins at a very fast pace. So this section shows the beginning. There's galloping horses. It's the embodiment of a man-centered world. The horses are being controlled by the Athenian men. So they're wild horses, but the Athenians are able to tame them. But as it's nears the east end, it actually slows down. And we see there's all the figures are different. There's no two figures that are alike. They're grouped together. They interact with each other, which is a symbol of the unity of the Athenian people. The fact that they all are similar, but they are interacting with one another, but yet they're unified as well. Here's another view of the marshals and young women. Here is the plan of the Parthenon. So again, the procession is slowing down. No two figures are alike. They're grouped. They're interacting with each other. They symbolize the unity of the Athenian people, but they also symbolize a worship of Athena. And part of this procession is depicting this ceremony. Women wove a new wool peplos and carried it to the Acropolis to clothe an ancient wooden cult statue of Athena. So if you think about that procession, marching around the Parthenon. This, here we have this Doric or peristyle, the shella inside, and this unconnected auxiliary space opening to the west. So it's created along a geometric proportion, which is called the golden mean, which is a perfect geometric proportion. So the procession around it symbolizes this perfection. And inside is this large chryselephantine sculpture of gold and ivory. So just to leave you with the Parthenon, here is how it looks now. So you can only imagine it in all its original glory and you get a sense of scale. Here's the tourists coming up and looking at it. So you get a good idea. Here's, here's where the, that photograph was taken with the frieze above it and the metope reliefs in the frieze behind. In the inside of the Carthenon is this large chryselephantine sculpture of Athena. It's a little hard to see on the left hand side, but you can see the sense of scale if you notice the people down in front of it. This picture on the right is an image of what this sculpture looks like. And here's the Parthenon as it is now complete with tourists. You get a good sense of the scale of this building and you can only imagine what it was like in all its original glory. The Erechtheion is the second largest structure on the Acropolis under Pericles and it was built between 430 and 405 BCE and there were several different shrines in it. It's got an asymmetrical plan in multiple levels because it's conforming to the hillside. And notice the porch of the maidens with the caryatid columns on the side of it. So 
After the Parthenon was done, Pericles commissioned Nexcocles to design this gatehouse, the Propylaea. So it contained the first known museum, interestingly enough. A museum is the home of the Muses, and a gallery which was built specifically to house paintings for public view. Here is the temple Nike, another structure on the Acropolis, and it's built with a porch on each end, which is called an amphiprostyle plan. So there's a blind porch facing over the city. There's no entrance to the cella from this blind porch. Here is the plan of the Erechtheion, which housed the sacred spring, which was dedicated to Erechtheus, who reigned during the age that Demeter instructed the Greeks about agriculture. So here's the Temple of Athena and Nike. So here is the Porch of the Maiden. This is the porch that's sticking out the side of the Erechtheion. It's on the south side facing the Parthenon. So we have six caryatids here with very simple Doric capitals that are supporting an Ionic entablature. So they're in a very classical pose. The drapery is falling vertically. It's very different than the marbles that we saw, for instance, of Hestia up on the Parthenon. There's the plan of the Erechtheion. So the Temple of Athena Nike is an Ionic order temple, and you can see the Ionic capitals on the four columns. Here's two views of the Temple of Athena Nike, one from the side. So again, you can see this amphiprostyle plan with the blind porch at one end. Very, very simple plan. This is a fragment of the relief decoration from the parapet, which is now destroyed, but this was from the Temple of Athena Nike on the Acropolis. And again, we see this treatment of the drapery that we saw in that image of Hestia on the Parthenon. The incredible attention to detail, the incredible attention to anatomy, the personality of Nike adjusting her sandal, the Athena Nike is the victory Athena. Nike accompanies her during times of war. So when Athena determines the winner of the battle, Nike flies in and changes the tides of war. So she would have had to have one wing open to help her balance. So again, this is the same system of balances that we will see in the spear bearer of Polycleitos. Her wings though have been damaged, but you can try to imagine which wing might have been open. We can't see from here which one was. One wing was sticking way out. Here's some other views of the frieze from the Temple of Athena Nike. So you can see now a Nike adjusting her sandal in situ, if you will. She's up in the center of the above photo. All right, so I've been talking about Polycleitos throughout this entire lecture, and now here he is. So I've been trying to lead up to this idea of a canon of beauty. So this sculptor named Polycleitos actually wrote a canon of beauty that discussed the way in which sculptors, all sculptors should show the human form. That the idea is that all objects in the physical world are reflections of ideal forms. So all of this ideal form could be discovered through reason. Now, this particular image of the spear bearer, you'll notice, you're like, wait a minute, that's not marble. Well, because this is a Roman copy. So this sculpture, the spear bearer, is probably the most important sculpture in the history of Greek art. And it's a visual illustration of this concept of ethos. Polycleitos wrote a canon. A canon is a rule, it's a standard, it relates the ideal proportions of the human body. And it's based on this Greek concept of symmetria. So the idea is a composition should consist of clearly divided parts. This should come as no surprise. From earliest times, we've seen this Greek concept of division into disparate items. So this canon of proportions is mathematical ratios in art, and it's based on measurements of the human body. So all of these measurements are unified around a stance which is called contrapposto. It has to do with a twisted pose that results from different parts of the body set in opposition to each other around a central axis. When we look at this sculpture today, we can see that it's anatomically correct. And it's important to look back at the history of art we've seen up to now and 
we can immediately see that we have not up until this time seen anything that is so incredibly correct down to the entire articulation of every muscle the twist and turn of each bone you can see the one hip above the other hip the fall of the flesh the musculature so this pose is an illustration of the separate parts of the human body. So there's all a counterbalancing. So we have one straight leg. When you try doing this, like if you're looking at this sculpture, it's really hard to do. You, so you, you, you bend your left leg and then the right arm is straight. And then the left knee is counterbalancing the weight bearing on the right hip. The head is turning to the right. The body is twisting to the left. So throughout the entire sculpture, Sculpture, one side is answering the other. This is called a rete. It's called excellence or beauty of mind, body, and spirit. So this canon represents the height of this classical thought that man is the measure of all things, figuratively and literally. The importance of this extends far beyond Greek, and we can, I'm just showing you this image now. If you take survey two, you'll see it again. The image on the right is Michelangelo's David. And Michelangelo, of course, is known as one of the greatest sculptors of all time the, from the Renaissance. And you can see here that Michelangelo is looking back at Polykleitos for his ideals of perfection. So it's absolute precision perfect balancing, all of the weight is supported over the engaged right leg. So it's a mathematical formula for perfection throughout tension and relaxation. So look at the spear bearer and the Critian boy. And again, the one on the left is a Roman copy. And there were many, many copies of this made. We have found throughout Rome, throughout Greece, again, because it is seen as perfection. So when you look at the Critian boy from the earlier classical period, you can see the beginnings of the understanding of anatomy. But in Polykleitos, Polykleitos sculpture, it's been given solidity and action. Again, if we look at the Rios warriors, we can see the contrapposto pose. So it's likely that the sculptors that created these Rios warriors had seen Polykleitos' canon of proportion. The treatment of the torso and the groin is similar in both. The left heel of the spear bearer is raised. Warrior A is standing still in alert relaxation, but, and the spear bearer is about to step forward. So here is the discus thrower by Myron. This was created around 450 BCE. And Myron was a master of depicting emotion. So he's taken a leaf from Polykleitos. Again, we have this tension, we have the weight on one leg, the twisting and turning, this contrapposto, this idea of contrast of opposites, but he's also taking the concept of rhythmos, which is a depiction of a single moment in an action, which by choosing the correct single moment, you can convey the whole nature of the movement, that you can read the figure from the front immediately and completely. So if you take this concept of looking at this single figure from the front, and then extrapolate this whole narrative sequence that we've looked at through the previous slides, we can see that not only are the Greeks seeing events of narratives, but even the events in one single action as a series of singular events, each to be captured. So Athens itself, the city, was on the site of a citadel, as we talked about at the beginning of this lecture. And the Acropolis was designed as one complete structure, as we've seen, but the city itself developed irregularly. In contrast, this city of Miletos was designed by Hipp Hippodamos after destruction by the Persians. And this is called the Hippodamian Plan, and it was promoted as an ideal 
of urban planning. So in this image, we have sacred, public, and private spaces all divided into spaces for artists, farmers, soldiers, other people, and it's all developed on a grid. So the original orthogonal city plan is developed as a total. So Hippodamus of Miletos was a philosopher. He was an early early urban planner, Socrates also, and Polycletos, all of them believed that humans could arrive at perfection through reason in different ways. So each different discipline had this idea of separating events, of separating ideas at arriving perfection. So this Hippodamian plan has six rectangular building plots, and this is still used today. There's no attempts to accommodate terrain. Some streets were actually stairs. And I put some links here to a website about the Hippodamian plan because it's pretty interesting. The Spartans defeated Athens in 404 BCE. Democracy failed and Athens fought back and overturned the Spartans, which led to war among the city-states with lack of central government. 387 BCE, Plato set up a school, Aristotle was slightly later. The fourth century BCE reflects a very high level of creativity and accomplishment, wide experimentation, and a break away from convention. We end up with a new group of patrons later, including Philip and Alexander, aristocrats in Asia Minor, and also other foreign rulers. And we have some new innovations in architecture, and then addition of a tholos and what's called the monumental tomb. So, during the mature classical period, Athens was the central authority in the Greek world, but its leaders mishandled the wealth of Greece. So we had the democracy, and as you remember, in the democracy, it was the demos who could be voted as leaders, and the demos were a certain class of young men, and so they led all of Greece and they ended out mishandling the wealth of Greece, which angered the other city-states like Sparta. So this war, the Peloponnesian War, was between Athens and Sparta, which lasted for about 30 years, 27 to 30 years. And this oppressive government that the Spartans put out caused the Athenians to revolt. So all of this war, this back and forth between Athens and Sparta with its resultant destruction, really changed the outlook of the Greek people. So at the beginning of this mature classical period with this triumph of reason, we had this idea that reason could triumph over, over emotion, that we've triumphed over the Persians, that our wisdom of Athena wins against all odds. So we have these high ideals, but it fails. And so after this failure, we have people just trying to survive. We have armies going back and forth. We have fields being burned. We have houses being burned. And so these great ideals that marked this mature classical period, this idea, man is the measure of all things, that reason triumphs over all, did not have the same kind of relevance to people that are just trying to survive. So the art of the late classical period emphasizes personal experience as opposed to a group experience or a collective experience. And we'll begin to see pathos, we'll begin to see an emotional response to experience, which takes precedence over ethos. So we begin to see some expressive works of art. They evoke feelings of anguish, of tenderness, of humor, even embarrassment. And we have figural groups that interact to evoke a response. This is the Tholos. There's a long history of beehive tombs, of round tombs. We've seen them way back at the time of the Mycenaeans. There are various uses for these round structures and many of the function are unknown. Here, the term pronea, the sanctuary of Athena pronea, just means in front of the temple. So this is a plan and section of the tholos, which a tholos really is a building with a circular plan. The exterior of the tholos is of the Doric order, and then the inside of it had a ring of columns, and the capitals are actually carved to resemble the acanthus plant. Now, in Roman 
oftentimes these were called Corinthian columns, although I'm not certain the Greeks called them that, but these later capitals are called Corinthian capitals. So on the outside we have this Doric column around the peristyle and then the Doric frieze, but on the inside it's Corinthian capitals. And in the mid fifth century BCE, we see many of these Corinthian capitals used in temple interiors. We didn't really see them on the exteriors until the Hellenistic period, which is a little bit later. This is a reconstruction drawing of the mausoleum, which is the tomb of Mausolos. So the Persian governor Mausolos has actually given us the modern term mausoleum, which is a large burial structure. And this was completed after he died by Artemisia. So the entire outside of it consisted of sculptures in the round, as well as ionic friezes. The roof was completely topped with marble statues of four horses, chariots, and drivers, the very top. And the friezes were all carved, again, with battle scenes of the Lapiths and the centaurs. This was actually glorified as one of the seven wonders of the world. It's no longer in existence, this whole tomb. This is a panel from the Amazon frieze from the south side of the mausoleum at Halicarnassos. was created by an artist named Scopus. We can still see the style of the Parthenon here, but it's got that Near Eastern violent flavor to it. And we've also got emotion here, strain movement, very passionate expression. And he also, Scopus was innovative. So for example, you can see the Amazon, she's seated backwards on her full horse. You would not see something like that on the Parthenon. Fourth century artists challenged and modified the standards of Polykleitos, and Praxiteles wrote a new canon for proportions. Longer legs, shorter torso, less grandiose, more minor gods, personal moments. And these are some of the, the earliest depictions of complete nudity, um, particularly in the nudity of women. We have three sculptures that we can look at, Praxiteles, Scopos, and Lysippos. Scopos, of course, was the sculptor for the mausoleum. So Praxiteles was active in Athens from 370 to 335 BCE. This particular sculpture is probably a copy. We have very little of his actual work surviving, but many, many copies. But he was recorded as an innovator, and he was very influential later in the Hellenistic period. So here is Hermes, the messenger god, and the infant Dionysos. It's done by Praxiteles or his followers. We're not sure which. So Dionysus was one of the few gods who was actually a baby. He was the product of an affair between Zeus and Semele, who was the princess of Thebes. So of course, like many of these stories, Hera was jealous of Semele, so Zeus had to hide Dionysus so that Hera would not take revenge on him. And Hermes took him to the satyrs, who raised him among all the woodland creatures, and Dionysus became the god of wine and the god of revelry. So this is a very personal statue. And you can see here the fun-loving Hermes. He's the god of travel. He's the messenger of the god. And you can't see it because his arm is missing, but he was actually dangling a bunch of grapes in front of the baby. He's teasing the baby. So we have this moment of human tenderness, this moment of playfulness. So Praxiteles change the canon of proportions. And here you can see the slenderness of Praxiteles sculpture, the less muscular, smaller head, very slight S curve to it, in contrast to the solidity, the singularity of parts, the precision of polykleitos. There's more fluidity, there's more emotion to Praxiteles type of humanity. This is Aphrodite of Cnidos by Praxiteles, and it's the first representation of a woman nude in Greek art. So it's a verge on the erotic. She's slightly covering herself, but she's also slightly inviting the viewer to look. So remember, Aphrodite is the goddess of love. She's just taken a bath and she's been seen. So this is the beginning of a long tradition of showing modesty in representing women in the modest pose. And it's interesting in Greek art because as we know from earliest times, the Greeks always felt that it was fine to depict the male body. It was actually should be depicted male because the nude male figure was the ideal of human beauty. But now 
with the rise of ethos, with the rise of emotion, with the rise of love, of pathos, we now have this idea of the humanity of woman as well. So these erotic representations of gods and goddesses were explored during the late classical period, but now it's come to a new emotional level. Now, Lysippos, we know a lot about him. This particular sculpture, this is actually a Roman copy after the bronze of 330 BCE, but this is uh, called the scraper. So instead of being active in sports, if you think back to Myron, he's using a strigil. He's all finished with his sport. He's scraping the sweat off. He's meditating, very dreamy expression. So it's a very different canon of proportions. The weight is more evenly distributed between the the engaged leg and the free one, the legs are in a wider stance, the spear bearer is oriented to a frontal view, the arms of the scraper are breaking free into the surrounding space. And Lysippos is depicting Alexander in an idealized fashion, but yet we have the same meditative expression that we saw on the scraper. The Romans admired Greek painting and they copied it on mosaic. We have very little painting left from the Greeks. This is a Roman mosaic copy of a Greek painting from 310 BCE. It's Alexander the Great confronting Darius III, and it's actually a mosaic from Pompeii, but I'm presenting it here to give you an idea of the subject matter of the Greek painting.